I would like first to start uh, with thanking the organizers for organizing this very nice uh, workshop here. Um, I will talk about new avenues towards complex pairing states in the following and uh, start with a short uh, 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 overview of concepts in condensed matter physics because uh, many, if not all of them, actually play a role in what we have heard in this workshop and what, what this uh, type of community is doing. So obviously we are, we are dealing with coherent states in superconductors where symmetry plays an important role. We have actually emergent symmetries. We have seen that we can, uh, we can create odd frequency uh, 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 order. Um, we, we, geometry plays an important role. I will talk about this a little bit in this talk. And also what I would like to, to uh, concentrate on this talk uh, is the, uh, the, the, the topology of uh, um, uh, state in condensed matter and uh, obviously correlations in, in correlated systems also play an important role in condensed matter physics and should also maybe a little bit more be taken into account in, in, in this Spintronics uh, community. So let me start with a, a short uh, overview over the basics of superconducting Spintronics because this has played an uh, important role um, <coughs> in, in this workshop. And uh, I would like to start with uh, and of bounce, bounce states at spin active interfaces by discussing first uh, a mechanism of creating such uh, magnetic uh, Andreev, magnetic uh, polarized, spin polarized uh, Andreev bounce states, uh, which was introduced by Tobiyashi Sousen Reiner in 1988. And this is the singlet triplet mixing, which appears in the vicinity of inferromagnetic insulator. And in, this, in the same time, also the induction of uh, the, the, the creation of a uh, spin polarized Andreev bound state um, <coughs> if you have a superconductor next to it. So, you, you can, in principle, you can think about this as a scattering problem where you have an incoming wave and a reflected wave. And uh, because this is a total reflection, there will, this, the scattering uh, uh, will, uh, will basically consist out of an. Uh, in an extra phase factor. So you have a phase which appears uh, in, in the scattered wave. And um, <coughs> so this phase factor can be spin dependent. So it's written here as uh, plus or minus theta over two, depending if you have spin up or spin down. And if you uh, now consider the, the, the relevant um, quasi particles which pair in order to build a, a, a singlet pair, for example, we want to build this, this uh, object here, then we will have to take this spin up with, with momentum k and pair it with spin down with this object here with momentum minus k, which means we have to bring that factor on the other side and combine it with this. And then we see that we, we are left just with one factor exponential i theta. And the same happens with, 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 with this pair just with the other sign, opposite sign. And we end up with, with this uh, conclusion that in the vicinity of, of such a ferromagnetic insulator, there necessarily will be always singlet triplet mixing taking place <coughs> between the pairs. Uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the triplet component which is created is of this form up, down, plus, down, up. So it will be proportional to the sign of the spin mixing angle, which is the spin dependent scattering phase shift during this reflection event. So this is an important parameter in this uh, uh, theory. And I will concentrate in, the, in what follows uh, strongly on this parameter, which is this uh, uh, spin, spin dependent scattering phase shift. Um, as I have see, shown, uh, you, if, you, if you have a singlet superconductor, so you have a singlet pair present in, in, uh, in the vicinity of the, of the surface, you will induce a triplet, one of the three triplets, which you, which you can create. And in particular, you will create a triplet pair, which has a spin projection on, on, on the z-axis equal to zero whereas that is given by the magnetization direction in the ferromagnet. Now, <coughs> um, another, uh, another consequence is if you have a superconductor next to a ferromagnetic insulator, that a spin polarized Andreev bound state appears. And this has been discussed also in this paper here by Mirel Vogelström. Um, <coughs> we, we had a short uh, uh, mention of this yesterday. So here I can discuss a bit more in detail. So what you see here is uh, the, the density of states plotted on the x-axis, epsilon over delta. And here on that axis is, is the spin, uh, spin dependent scattering phase shift theta, um, <coughs> varying from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, just so that you see how the periodicity appears in the bound state. Of course, everything is 2 pi periodic here. So 
if you, if you start with zero spin missing angle, you just get a BCS density of states, just what you see also in front here. And then as soon as the spin mixing angle becomes finite, a, a, a bound state splits off for spin up at a positive gap edge and for spin down at a negative gap edge, and then uh, disperses to the, to the other, other side, the negative gap edge in this case and the positive one in this, in this case. And you can see that they are, that are completely spin polarized. So this, so, so this one is, pol uh, is completely spin up and this one is completely spin down. So, <clears throat> uh, this is very nice because it means when we populate these Andreev bound states, there will be a strong spin dependence appearing. So if you, if you discuss then uh, Andreev reflection events and so on, this will be strongly spin dependent. <clears throat> so as an example, I would like to discuss first uh, the case of, of, of a slab of superfluid helium-3 in, in its B phase. Um, where we assume that we have spin-active interfaces, and this is motivated by, by recent developments, uh, experimental developments, that you can actually create spin-polarized surfaces in helium-3 <coughs> um, in, 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 in cavities, because you can have, uh, you can have layers of helium-3 which, which uh, become localized at the surface and, and become spin-polarized. So there are avenues towards this uh, possibility and so, so we just decided to study this, this problem theoretically. So in this case, we will have an order parameter which is of triplet form. So it's a spin triplet order parameter. It's P wave order parameter in this case. Px, Py, and Pz are the orbital uh, 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 parts of the, of the order parameter. And then sigma x, sigma y, sigma z are the corresponding Pauli matrices in spin space. <coughs> Small x is just the, the orbital coordinate and capital X, Y, and Z are the spin coordinates. So if you look at the uh, local density of states at the interface for a normal impact trajectory, in this case, <coughs> for zero spin mixing angle, which corresponds to the lower, lower curve here, then we see first that it's not spin polarized, so spin up and spin down are the same. And, and, you, will, and you have also a feature at, at around zero energy. And this comes from the fact that in a P-wave superconductor, you will have, uh, <coughs> for a normal impact, these two first terms are zero. And the last term uh, changes sign depending if you have positive or negative direction in the z direction. And this sign change ensures that you will have bounce, you will have Andreev bound states in the vicinity of, of zero energy. And because we have a slab geometry here, <coughs> this is not a pure zero energy bound state, but it is split into a band of bound states. Now, if the uh, spin mixing angle is increased, then what we see is that the zero energy uh, feature here this process towards the gap edge on this side for spin up and towards the other gap edge for spin down. And then in the limit, when you, when you, when you have actually a phase shift of pi, then what happens is that you, that you uh, recover the, the usual BCS density of states as if you would have a, a simple S-wave superconductor. And what happens here is that the phase shifts that appear from, from the reflection on, at its interfaces cancel exactly the sign change of that factor Pz which you have there when you reflect from positive to negative directions. And we can also see this if you look at the self-consistently determined order parameter for profiles here. On the left-hand side, you see that the same geometry. So <coughs> um, if in, in the beginning, if you, if you uh, have no spin mixing at the interfaces, you will have one component, the delta ZZ component, that goes to zero at the, at the uh, two interfaces, and the other ones stay finite. And now if, if your spin mixing angle goes towards pi, which, uh, which means that these lines uh, merge towards this, pink, uh, this uh, purple line here, what you, what you end up with is that all three components that, that you have here are identical equal to this purple line on a constant. So just like, it's like, like as if, if you have Anderson's theorem in an S-wave superconductor, you get a constant order parameter. And you have basically undone the, the, the uh, influence of the <coughs> uh, triplet P wave uh, symmetry. If you do, if you now switch this, the direction of this uh, uh, magnetization to the x direction, what happens now is that uh, because now your 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 spin uh, uh, will now be affected for in, in the direction of x, it will now influence this this component instead of the last one. And what happens now in this case is that one of these two components, which stay finite here, starts to develop a depression at their surfaces, and you end up 
when you have a spin mixing angle of pi, you end up with two, two parameters that go to zero at the surface and one that stays finite. So you can actually, with, with this, with playing with, with the spin mixing at the, at the interfaces, you can actually turn um, <coughs> the behavior, you can drastically alter the behavior of the, of the uh, order parameter at the interfaces in, in uh, superfluid helium 3 in the B phase. So uh, <coughs> the following, I will quickly give you an uh, overview over some additional uh, um, facts which follow from this mechanism. So we have uh, studied, so you have heard the talk about uh, thermoelectric effects in the, in the workshop, <coughs> um, which, which, is, which was based on uh, spin splitting in the superconducting state when you have an applied field. Here we have studied a slightly different case when you have actually a three terminal junction where you have two terminals are uh, normal metals, like these two normal metals. The coupling is via a ferromagnetic insulator here, this is the blue part. And then you couple this all to a superconducting uh, layer in, in the bottom here. And what you do is you, <coughs> you, you for example, you can, you can uh, heat at this terminal and then measure what is the voltage appearing at, between the other two terminals. And this is a non-local effect and it creates a, a, a non-local thermoelectric uh, uh, power and you can see that we can get actually easily value, uh, values of 100 microvolt per Kelvin and uh, figure of merits which are close to two, we can reach through that. Okay, another example, I'll, we have just heard a talk about uh, long range spin trip, striplet supercurrents. So for that, what we need to do is, we need to actually turn this component, which is just as short range as the singlet is, into the long range components. And this can be done by introducing uh, an, an, a misalignment of this uh, insulating layer here with respect to the ferromagnet. And then you will create uh, the, the you, you have rotated, so this was just mentioned by Jan Arts in the previous talk, this mechanism of uh, a rotating of the triplets, <coughs> um, which, which I discussed in, in uh, uh, Physics Today in 2011. And um, so, so in this case, you can create these long range components and you can actually create now a long range Josephson effect to, for example, a half metallic ferromagnet. This is an example which we calculated uh, for, for a half metallic case. So what you see is you have two singlet superconductors. In this case, they have a relative phase difference of pi. It turns out this is just uh, energetically stable. And in the middle, you have polarized uh, uh, this system by the appearance of triplet correlations. And one of these triplets will then couple the two singlet components indirectly. And you, you will have a Josephson effect via this mechanism. <coughs> there have been uh, basically three different types of these uh, 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 Josephson junctions. The first one uh, was suggested in 2001 uh, by, by the group of Anatoly Volkov with, with uh, Sebastian Bergeret as a student in that time. And so they suggested uh, that, uh, that, that you can actually create this uh, uh, supercurrents when you have some, some spiral order present at the, at the, near the interfaces. Um, <coughs> another, another option is that you, that you uh, look at uh, ferromagnetic insulating layers. This is what I just have mentioned now. And the third option, this was discussed by Jose et al, is if you actually have metallic uh, layers, which you so you can engineer this junction by adding ad additional ferromagnetic layers here that, that also are metallic and you can create a, a, a supercurrent by this mechanism as well. Um, <coughs> finally, phase batteries are an option which you can create with, uh, with such junctions. So here's an example. Again, you have two superconductors, you have a ferromagnet in the middle, and then you have two uh, ferromagnetic insulating surfaces. And the magnetic moments of these two surfaces are now misaligned with respect to the magnetization and also misaligned with respect to each other. And if you do that in such a way that all three of them are non coplanar then you can, can define this angle delta phi, which is basically this, uh, this angle here. So you have we have these two magnetization, these magnetic moments, the magnetization, and then delta phi is that. And it turns out that this angle here is a geometric angle. <coughs> it's only determined by the geometric arrangements of the magnetic moments. It's a, a geometric phase which appears in this junction, which handles the current phase relation in an in, uh, intriguing way. Um, <coughs> so if you write down the first terms for such a Josephson junction for spin up pairs and for spin down pairs, then you see that you have first two terms here, 
that do not depend on this additional delta phi angle. They, they, they are the, the terms which are so-called cross-pair transmission processes where pair spin up and spin down pair simultaneously pass from left to right. So that when you add the two phases here, they, the delta phi cancels and you get two delta chi, right? So delta chi is just the phase difference between the two condensates. And then the single particle terms, they are shifted by plus minus delta phi depending on the spin. Which means that actually spin up pairs and spin down pairs are sitting in different uh, phases in, inside the ferromagnet. So this leads to effects like, for example, uh, that uh, if you have, if, 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 you, if you choose uh, delta phi as, at a finite value, for example here, then your equilibrium phase difference between the left and right superconducting banks is neither zero nor pi, so, but it's something in between. And depending how strong your first term is, this I11 for example, you can continuously tune this junction. So you will have a phi junction that you can continuously tune, tune, or you can create the systems where you actually jump, where you have first order transitions here, or you can, you can tune it to such a behavior. So you, you can have all these behaviors depending on how strong the cross pair transmission term is with respect to the single particle, single pair tunneling. <clears throat> okay, now um, next I would like to discuss topology a little bit more. And for that, I first uh, thought that I will discuss zero energy uh, and wave bound states in time reversal symmetric superconductors. And uh, for this, uh, <coughs> in order to understand this, uh, what, what, how the topology comes about, it's very uh, instructive to look at the Andreev equations, which I have written down here, for, for a particular trajectory, which is, which is determined by the Fermi velocity, which points in a certain direction, and the trajectory will be parallel to that, to that direction. And, um, and you, you assume that you have a general order parameter, which can be a, a mixture between singlet and triplet. Now, time reversal symmetry requires that, that these two relations hold here. And if that is given, if, you, if your Hamiltonian is time reversal symmetric, then you can actually perform a canonical transformation in such a way that you turn your Hamiltonian purely off diagonal. So you can turn this one in this form. So the, the, the transformation matrix is independent on, uh, on, on, on the parameters in this Hamiltonian. It's just a simple matrix here. And you, you will end up with this Hamiltonian, which is purely off diagonal. So this is, this is just a simple transformation from here to here, right? And your new, your new uh, uh, Andreev amplitudes, they will of course then be linear combinations of the old ones. Now let's look at what the solutions of these equations are. They are very simple to obtain in this case. Um, and in particular, we are interested in zero energy states. So this right hand side will be zero in our case. So the two solutions are written down here. So these are uh, proportional to exponentials, which in involve integrals over the order parameter delta with a plus or minus sign in front. And now what we have to do is we have to consider um, which of, so if, if we go to plus or minus infinity with our, with our variable rho, does, does actually this uh, component stay finite or does it become infinite? And you see immediately this component V here uh, stays finite for both delta to plus infinity and to minus infinity when, when you have a, a, a sign change in the order parameter somewhere here at an interface, for example. Because if it's negative for, for positive directions, um, if delta from infinity is negative, then this will converge. And if it's for negative directions uh, positive, then the rho will be smaller than rho s. This gives you an additional minus sign. It will also converge. On the other hand, u will be diverging in both directions. And for that reason, u, the prefactor of u has to be zero. And so the only solution you can get, which is normalizable in this case, is actually this one. It's zero vs. And if you if you rewrite this now in the original coordinates, it turns out that you will have uh, you will have an uh, 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 Andreev amplitudes that have uh, equal weights. So just uh, some spin dependence. This is sigma zero matrix and sigma y Pauli matrix there. Now if you if you just change these two, you, if you if you make it on this side minus and that side plus, all what changes is the rows between u and v. What you end up with is now, instead of having, instead of having zero v, you will have now u zero. So the other component has to be zero, right? And in this case, again, you will get a solution, which then in the original coordinates has this form. And in both cases, you will have a zero energy bound state. 
In contrast, if you have now plus plus, for example, here, then you will have the case that u diverges for, 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 for coordinates going towards plus infinity, uh, uh, towards minus infinity, and v diverges towards plus infinity. So both of them have to be zero. So you get actually a zero vector, and zero is not an eigenvector. So you did not find any eigenvectors. You have shown that there is no eigenvector at epsilon equals zero, and that means that you have shown that there's no bound state at epsilon equals zero. So this is the case when there is no bound state appearing at the <coughs> at, at, at uh, 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 the mid of between between the gap edges uh, at, at epsilon equals zero. So so basically this is this is all what is what the topology is about. So the topology ensures the important step is the topology ensures that one of these components is zero, and as a consequence. The one of the, from, from the two Andreev amplitudes, u and v, one of them becomes a slave. One of them is just tied to the other one by a, by a simple relation at every point. So it's, it is, this is an identity which holds for the entire trajectory, and one of the components becomes a slave of the other. And as a consequence, this is, this is, the, this is the, the why, why this, this is a topological feature which you have there. So, and then, then you find that actually when you have a sign change between minus and plus infinity in the order parameter, irrespective how the order parameter uh, varies in between, you will have a zero energy topological bound state. <coughs> you can also, um, there is something called bulk surface correspondence, you can also discuss this uh, by just looking at the bulk Hamiltonian instead of really solving transport equations, we are really explicitly solved for the bound states at the, at the interface, you can also just discuss a bulk Hamiltonian, uh, which is written down here, for example, for the superconductor in particle hole space. And you do again, you, you, you do a transformation which, which holds for time reversal symmetry, which, which turns this Hamiltonian into something purely of diagonal. And in this case, if you do that, you, <coughs> what you can do is you, the, the transformation will be the, of this form here. And in the middle, you will have the, the, the uh, uh, eigenvalues or singular values in this case for, for, for the matrix which you have. And if you replace them all by one or minus one, depending what the sign of them is, and you reconstruct your matrix, then you can write it in this form. Uh, uh, you can define a number which, has, which only takes integer values. So this is a so-called one dewinding number, which you, which you define along a loop within a Boolean zone, in, in this case a contractible loop. And you can calculate it, and it turns out that this number will take on non-trivial values whenever you have a topological uh, stable bound state. Now, uh, for a D-wave superconductor, for example, when you have this form here, <coughs> then you can show that uh, if, you, if, you choose a, a uh, if you choose a, a loop there, um <coughs> then you will get that this number is, is uh, plus or minus two. Now, in, in the following, I would like to discuss a little bit more to the, the topology in non-central symmetric superconductors. And uh, in this case, <coughs> uh, we consider a Hamiltonian, which has this form, which has a spin orbit term here, and it has the usual bad structure term there. And uh, in general, this, uh, th this, these terms will all be matrices in, in uh, band space. So there will be terms which have band indices as well. However, when you have time reversal and inversion symmetry in the system, there is, a, there is there's identity which holds a symmetry, which tells you that you have a sign change whenever you switch the two band indices. And if you, and this in particular tells you that this, this, uh, this spin orbit coupling vanishes when, when you have the two, two band indices equal, right? So that tells you immediately that <coughs> you have to have a non-central symmetric material in order to be able to have such a term which is just sitting in one band, right? Which is band diagonal. Only in non-central symmetric crystals this works, <coughs> which does not say that the, that the spin orbit coupling is absent in central symmetric systems. Systems, however, in this case you will need more than one band. So let's assume that we have a non-central symmetric system and we have just a, we have written down a single uh, effective one-band Hamiltonian, where we have the spin orbit coupling now here. Then we can discuss various symmetries. So, for example, we can have cubic symmetry, or we can have uh, a system which has full tetrahedral, tetrahedral point group symmetry, um, and we can we can discuss what are the leading terms for for um, <coughs> yep. so what are the leading terms for the spin orbit uh, uh, vectors. So the spin orbit vectors are written down here. These are the leading leading terms 
for, for the cubic point group, and these are the leading terms for the full tetrahedral point group. And um, <coughs> so, we, so we can, in this case, we have an additional tuning parameter because uh, if, we, if we just write, it, uh, write down the leading term, it is quite simple. So in this case, we, uh, we have additional uh, possibility to, to get a non-trivial structure like is shown here, for example. Um, you can also have, for example, in a tetragonal point group, this was the first one discussed extensively, where you have a ball crush bar coupling, um, which has a particular simple structure. So in this case, <coughs> that we, this was a, we had discussed in 2008, you have, in this case, a surface, spin polarized surface and rare states, just like we, we discussed at the beginning. Um, in this case, they are induced by the spin orbit coupling. And uh, if you look, for example, at, at the trajectory going from here to there, this corresponds to the first picture. However, if you go in the opposite direction, then it is corresponds to the second picture, the role of spin up and spin down change. So that means you have, you have, in, you have spin up traveling in this direction, then you always have a bound state spin down traveling in the opposite direction, which leads to a spin current. And the spin current can be calculated, and it's a spin current which flows along the, the, the surface uh, in, in, in the uh, spin orbit coupled superconductor. So, um, what, we, what we did was we, we used, for example, we, 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 we took as an input such, uh, spin, so such a field of spin orbit vectors and then calculated the order parameter self consistently, allowing for a single triplet mixture of this form. We have seen this in the talk of uh, Dirk Manske before. So, we, we, there's, this, this has a particular form here, which is uh, theoretically motivated. And, and we solve the self-consistency equation, and then we have to be careful about uh, the possibility of, of having uh, several nucleation channels. So there can be subdominant channels and dominant channels. And here's just an example how we start with, with random initial values, and then we converge to various solutions. The solutions are these red points here. And, and then we can calculate the temperature dependence, for example, of the order parameters for, for dominant or subdominant channel. And after we have done that, we can calculate also the spectral quantities. We can, for example, calculate for a certain interface what is the, uh, what is the tunneling spectrum. So we do, we do exactly what we did before. We, pr we, we, we define topological invariance by doing this canonical transformation, bringing it in this form. And in this case, it's interesting to also consider three-dimensional winding numbers, which are defined. So you see the one-dimensional winding number were defi was defined like this as a as an integral over a loop. Now this is an integral over the full Brillouin zone, and it involves this, uh, uh, this threefold combination of this uh, uh, quantity here. And uh, a third possibility is, so, so this, this quantity is not time reversal invariant in general because the loop in general does not have to involve the time reversed momenta. It can be very general in the Brillouin zone. However, if you choose a non-contractible loop, which goes from one end of the, from one border of the Brillouin zone to another one, in such a way that for each k there is also the time reversed k involved. Then you can define yet another uh, winding number, which is this one here, <coughs> which, which then again is a number which is uh, uh, defined for for uh, time for time reversal uh, symmetry conserved Hamiltonians. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> here's here's an example for for the case of a cubic point group where we have this uh, that type of uh, uh, spin orbit uh, field. So, so here in this case, for example, the spin orbit vectors are plotted um, as a function of momentum direction. So in the case of a cubic system, there are no line nodes in the spin orbit coupling. There are only point nodes. And this allows you to choose to have Fermi surface in such a way that it does not have anywhere a zero or of, 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 a, of a spin orbit vector. So you can choose the Fermi surface so that it avoids the point nodes. This is not possible in general when you have line nodes uh, in, in the spin orbit field. And because of this, we can have fully gapped systems. And it, the fully gapped system is, is, is required in order to be able to define this three-dimensional topological number. And <coughs> so, what we can, so what we discussed was we can tune our Fermi surface by changing the chemical potential. And we can even change our Fermi surface from a closed Fermi surface to an open Fermi surface, so the topology of the Fermi surface itself changes. Whenever that happens, there will be also a change in the topological number, which is the, the numbers are written down in here. So we have various phases that appear depending on what is the chemical potential and depending on what is this parameter G2, which we have here. So the phase diagrams as function, 
uh, of G2 are shown here. So you can see in, in, this, in this axis what is the ratio between the singlet and triplet component. And depending on this ratio, you will have topological trivial states, which is the white region, or you have topologically non-trivial states with a, with a one-dimensional number, where this number is non-zero here. Uh, this is the gray region. Or you can have topologically non-trivial states where the three-dimensional invariant, which is this one here, is non-zero. And these are the colored regions here. <coughs> so what we also can do, we can calculate the surface band structure. We do this by doing a Fourier transform in, in one of the momenta. So we define parallel and perpendicular momentum with respect to the surface. And then we transform the perpendicular momentum again to a spatial variable in order to, to turn our Hamiltonian in a sum over Hamiltonians which live in a layer. They have a layer index and they have hopping terms. So after this, we, so if once we have done this, we can discretize also the center of mass coordinate in, 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 the, in, in multiples of the periodicity in the lattice. And this gives us now a lattice Hamiltonian. And we can, we can simply diagonalize this and we will get a band structure, the surface band structure for this case. And we can study the, the uh, dispersion of the surface states as well. So here's an example for, um, for such a calculation. <coughs> um, so what is shown here in these various pictures is in, in the first, in the left hand side here, these are the Andreev bound states which you see with, uh, where the spin polarization is plotted uh, going from, from, from positive to negative. So you have spin polarized bound states here. Um, on the right picture you see the band structure calculated by this method and you see these, you see these uh, zero energy states that are flat, so they don't have any dispersion. And these flat bound states, which you have there, these are signatures of topological bound states. So topological protected bound states, they usually are, they have this flat dispersion over a finite region in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the Brillouin zone. So here in this picture, you see, for example, the black regions is where you have this flat dispersions. So everywhere where you see black, this is a zero energy region. You can also calculate the, where the Andreev bound states appear and you will see that they appear exactly in the regions where you have this flat dispersion. So these are the Andreev states, just calculated uh, uh, by solving the Andreev equations. And you can also calculate explicitly the topological invariants for these various uh, cases and then you find that in the white region you have trivial topological invariants and in these uh, colored regions you have plus or minus one uh, winding number for n which is with respect to the 1, 1, 1 direction. So these pictures, of course, they depend all on which direction you are looking at. So in which direction you cut yourself, the, in which, the, in which your, uh, direction you cut your crystal in order to create a surface. <coughs> um, so he, if, we, if we do this for the, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm almost done. Yeah. So if we do this for the, for the various, uh, uh, symmetries, so we, we have this for the cubic symmetry, for, for tetragonal and uh, um, <coughs> tetrahedral symmetry. So we, we, can, we see that we can define the various uh, spin orbit fields and we can calculate the, the uh, uh, tunneling spectra for these cases. And you see that in all three cases for this 1, 1, 1 orientation, you, you see very sharp zero bias peaks. And these zero bias peaks, they are topologically protected states as can be seen by calculating the, the, the various uh, uh, topological numbers here and which are the colored regions. And you even see a region here, this red one, which has a non-zero um, um, value for, um, <coughs> for, this additional, for, for, for an additional uh, invariant, which I didn't introduce here, which is defined uh, um, as a Z2 topological invariant. So the C2 topological invariant is calculated by, uh, by a construction which involves something so-called Pfaffian. And um, so if you do this, then you will find that in this, in this, for, for these directions here, you have a time reversal invariant, one-dimensional Hamiltonian, and it is, has a non-trivial uh, topological, Z2 topological number, and corresponds to these states which you have here in the middle between these two. Okay, so just to, 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 I have I've discussed a lot of topological ground state properties. I just want to mention that, of course, there are two aspects of topology. One is the ground state, which connects the bulk properties with the interfaces, which we have just uh, seen. And there's, of course, a whole other uh, aspect, which are topological excitations, 
which, which typically give rise to dissipation in systems, and I haven't talked about those at all. So with this, I just flash my summary, and I thank you for your attention.